Hello, my dears. I know that I am late to the party on this topic, but it's fine and we're fine and this is definitely still relevant. Also, yes, the reason it took me this long to make the video is because I spent three weeks procrastinating watching music. We're not going to talk about it. Hi, my name is Sydney. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm an openly queer, disabled, autistic, trans, non-binary actor, composer, educator, media analyst, and disability advocate, and at this point, Pretty much all of the media that I consume is disability representation because I make 90 second reviews twice a week um, of disability representation and I have been doing that for over a year and so that gives me a very unique perspective on disability representation in general and music as a film in particular and also its historical context which we're gonna get into today. Also I'm a white person um, in my early 20s with light brown shoulder length curly hair with a purple bow in it and I'm wearing a cream colored uh, dress that has thin straps and it has uh, pink and purple flowers on it. I feel like I should prep these before I film. I never prep them before I film and I always forget how clothes work and how descriptions work. I'm sorry about that. And I'm sitting in front of a bookshelf and above the bookshelf there are a couple photos hanging on the wall. Now the general plan for this video is to talk about the music controversy, kind of break down the film in depth, and then talk about all of this within the lens of the new knowledge that Sia is autistic. This is not defending her behavior at all at all, but just looking at it differently and understanding how and why undiagnosed autistics often make the most harmful allies and what we can learn from that. Also, we will talk about this later in the video as well, but the community has a tendency to get very reasonably upset by this whole situation and will often say or comment things being, again, reasonably frustrated at Sia and this film that also indirectly encourage harmful rhetoric towards autistic and disabled people. So you're super welcome to like, comment your thoughts and opinions. I really look forward to hearing them, but please keep that in mind while you do so because critiquing ableism by being further ableist is not the move and not just don't do that. Also, content warning for discussions of restraint, ableism, potential grooming, racism, domestic abuse, institutionalization, and addiction. This is going to be a video. So Sia, if you don't know who Sia is, uh, she's an Australian musician who's famous for her solo work as well as her writing with many other musicians. You may know her from songs like Chandelier, Elastic Heart, Titanium, and Cheap Thrills. That was the first song at my senior prom. She's one of those artists who I personally never like voluntarily listened to, but then recently realized that I know a lot of her songs anyway somehow. And I also genuinely really like her music, which I've just discovered. And that is an unfortunate thing to have figured out right now, but that's beside the point. She struggled severely in the past with addiction and mental illness, mostly because of her struggles with fame and her general dislike of it. So she's known for wearing wigs that cover most, if not all of her face in public to help with that anxiety. And Generally, she's known for being very eccentric and out there with her fashion and her art. In November of 2020, she dropped the trailer to her first film, which is titled Music, about a non-speaking autistic girl named Music, played by the non-autistic Maddie Ziegler, that was filmed in 2017. And then Twitter exploded and the autistic community went into crisis mode and it was a mess. We're gonna get into that. Then the film itself came out in Australia in January and Twitter exploded a second time. Then in February, Sia deleted her Twitter. Um, just before the film came out in the United States. And then she announced in May of this year that she is autistic, which has brought up this whole conversation again, which is super important, particularly because this whole situation has been crucial in bringing the problems with disability representation into the more mainstream spotlight and taught a lot of people about autism that wouldn't have otherwise learned about it or seen our community as existing. But it's also a really great example of how intention does not equal impact. And no matter how much like care and effort we put into something that does not mean that that thing cannot still cause serious harm and that we should hold people responsibility for the harm that has been caused. So we're going to start with a super basic synopsis. We'll get more in depth about it later in this video, but basically music is a non-speaking autistic 16 year old girl. She lives with her grandmother. It's implied that this is because her mother died presumably of an overdose. And then when her grandmother dies, music's half sister who is in her mid twenties ish and newly sober becomes music's sole caretaker. Her name is Kazu. Kazu, I don't remember. I'm not going to go watch the film again to figure that out. She calls herself Zu for short. I know that for sure. Their neighbor, Ebo, is an immigrant from Ghana and he offers to help Zu with music and then they end up falling for each other and some other stuff happens, but we're gonna get to that later. Music could effectively be replaced by a dog and the plot would be absolutely no different. Um, there's also a domestic abuse murder subplot that never connects to the main story and I'm still not sure why it was there. And then the characters' inner worlds are reflected through interpretive dancey music videos that intercut the film. 
Conceptually, it seems like a really cool artistic idea, but the final product gives off strong vibes of those musicals that like use rock music in them and then based on the genre, the people who are writing them feel like they need to be dark and edgy with their stories so then they throw in every single social issue and minority into it to seem deep but actually don't explore any of them or handle any of them properly. But then they get mad when they're criticized about it because they're like, we gave you representation and you never get any so you should be grateful without realizing that most people would rather have no representation at all than horrifically insensitive and performative representation. And it's always a shame because the music is always really incredible when the script is a disaster. And this usually happens with musicals, but in this case it happened with a film. Anyway, okay, so the trailer was released on Twitter and the autistic community had things to say, particularly wondering, hmm, why didn't you cast an autistic actor in the role? And generally, Sia, did you do any research at all? And um, here's how that went. Several autistic actors, myself included, responded to these tweets. We all said we could have acted in it on short notice. These excuses are just that. Excuses. The fact of the matter is zero effort was made to include anyone who is actually autistic. And Sia responds with, maybe you're just a bad actor. I don't think we need to explain why that's a problem. Uh, first of all, autistic people make great actors, and the fact that she didn't put in any effort at all to find one is a shame. And second of all, she could have said literally anything else, but went for the basic low-level attack that basically admitted her guilt in not attempting to include autistic people. Though there was another tweet that said, I cast 13 neuroatypical people, three trans folk, and not as effing prostitutes or drug addicts, but as doctors, nurses, and singers. Effing sad nobody's even seen the dang movie. My heart has always been in the right place. And not to like, dissect someone's language, but there are a couple things that we can point out here. First, neuroatypical is a word generally avoided in the neurodivergent community because it's not really inclusive and it focuses on the idea of typicality. So her use of that word alone screams to me that she did not consult the community for this. Second of all, us simply existing in your movie does not make it better. And the fact that she's like, you should be thanking me for putting you in these kinds of roles and not these kinds is also very weird. First of all, because autistic and trans sex workers and addicts exist, but also that in this tweet, she's clearly denigrating some life experiences to try to make herself and her film look better in a way that's making her come across as kind of classist and ableist and icky and gross. Not to mention that neuroatypical covers a vast range of neurodivergencies, which means that she could very well be saying, don't be mad at me about the autism representation. I had 13 people with diagnosed anxiety disorders in my film, so actually it was fine and you're overreacting, which is not how that works at all. And also cool. I love that her heart was in the right place, but if her actions were not in the right place, there's still a problem, because that's how that works. But then we have another tweet that said, I actually tried working with a beautiful young girl, nonverbal on the spectrum, and she found it unpleasant and stressful. So that's why I cast Maddie. And this makes it seem like maybe she did try to do the right thing, but also if your movie is about disability inclusion and you can't, I don't know, figure out how to include disabled people. That seems like an issue to me. Acting is not for everybody, it can be very overwhelming, but the fact that an autistic actor found your set to be unpleasant and stressful means that you need to change the environment to be more accommodating to her needs. That being said, Maddie and Sia have both talked about Maddie working on the project for a while and spending years doing research, which timeline-wise makes it seem like the initial girl she's referring to actually never existed, and her tweet saying, I've never referred to music as disabled, special abilities is what I've always said, and casting someone at her level of functioning was cruel, not kind. So I made the executive decision that we would do our best to lovingly represent the community, pretty much confirms that she didn't even attempt to find somebody to cast in the role. And the general vibe of her relationship with Maddie also pretty much confirms that Maddie was in the project from day one, but we're gonna to get to that in a little bit. Also using functioning labels is outdated and ableist. We don't use those in the community anymore. And special abilities is a term for sure. Um, bottom line, disabled is not a bad word and autistic is not a bad word. So using lots of euphemisms to try to make it sound nicer ends up just furthering stigma and makes things worse for everyone, which again, had she done more research into the community at all, really, she would have known this and not be making these blatant errors. Now, when people ask if she'd done any research on the film, she went, duh, I spent three effing years researching. I think that's why I'm so effing bummed. I'm sorry, it sounds weird to say effing, but I just really don't want to swear on my channel or have to bleep everything out. Um, and that the character was based completely on my neuroatypical friend. He found it too stressful being nonverbal and I made this movie with nothing but love for him and his mother. I'm not quite sure what that tweet means if I'm gonna be completely honest, but we're just, We'll just move on. She also said that she had two people on the spectrum advising her at all times. And again, the term on the spectrum is another euphemism to avoid using the word autistic. And I should mention that in one of the interviews I watched, she specifically said, as soon as anyone brought a bad vibe, I was like, you're fired. Um, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, so 
I, I really believe we ended up with the best film because we had we came to work every day with uh, good intentions. If you're basing your hiring and firing based on solely good and bad vibes, you're gonna end up with a cast and crew of yes men who agree to every single one of your ideas so that they can keep their jobs, which what we know of the final product aside makes me not really trust the quality of the critique or feedback given by those advisors on the spectrum, if they existed at all, because a lot of the things she said during this Twitter storm counteract each other and don't always seem truthful. It also came out that she had been working with Autism Speaks on this film. Now, if you're not familiar with that, lovely organization. I have a video about them that's linked in the card above that you can check out, but basically they are an ableist and eugenicist hate group breaking in money that operates under the guise of helping autistic people. Um, and when confronted about this, Sia tweets, Autism Speaks came on board long after the film was finished. Four years, in fact, I had no idea it was such a polarizing group. Which, if she had done research for three years and had looked into the autism community even the tiniest bit, or talk to a single autistic person, she would have already known that, as it's one of the most well-known things in our community that is pretty much universally agreed upon. It was the first thing I learned about the autistic community before I was even diagnosed. And the other thing to note is that this tweet isn't even true, because somebody had told her seven months prior to this via tweet that Autism Speaks is a hate organization that she should be working with, and she responded with a tweet saying, oh shit. So she already knew this before everything fell apart in November. So she may have been doing research for three years, and I think that she does believe that, but that very well might have been like reading the Autism Speaks website three years ago, and then watching Rain Man twice and calling it a day, because that's what this feels like. And in fact, in an interview, she said, With this movie, uh, I, I wanted to make it like the old movies, you know, that like Forrest Gump and Rain Man and, you know, I short described this movie as Rain Man the Musical, um, <laughs> but with girls. Oh, and there's also this other bit from this interview that we definitely cannot forget about. Here's this person who can't speak. You know, she might as well be like an inanimate object, like a wig, except there's so much going on in there. Yeah. So sorry if I'm reading a little too much into it. You are, but I love it. That's what <laughs> movies and music are for. They're for you to project your stuff onto. Like once it's finished, it belongs to you, you know? Love it. You know, what do you hope uh, people take away from this movie? What, what are you trying to put out there? Um, I want people to know that there's somebody in there and don't talk about them like they're not there because... They understand exactly what you're saying, even if it's not in the moment. Um, I think it's cruel to talk about people like they're not there if they're special needs in any in any capacity. Um, I also, you know, it's a love letter. I've always, I don't know why, but I've always had a thing for as a special, and they're called special abilities now, not special needs. Um, yeah, the people with special abilities and also for the caregivers of those people. I want compassion, really. She says they're called special abilities now, so confidently too, which again, really puts the level of depth of that research into question for me. And she also fully agrees with the interviewer referring to non-speaking autistic people as inanimate objects, which is a yikes for sure. There's this wide-eyed innocence of this character, music, that in times like this is almost like so radically different. And it's so, just feels so nice, you know? Like, let's get back to that. Pure, it's a pure. Yeah. And that's what I've always found with the special abilities people that I've fallen in love with is this purity. Disabled folks are not inherently pure, and we're not here to teach you about how to appreciate the world or whatever other terrible patronizing ableist message they were intending for that to come across as. Not a fan. Then there's also this interview where she talks about casting Maddie in the role, and she says, I realized it wasn't ableism. I mean, it is ableism, I, I'm, I, I guess, as well, but it's actually nepotism because I can't do a project without her. I don't want to. I wouldn't make art if it didn't include her. And she didn't even take the time to acknowledge that maybe those are bad things um, and that maybe she should apologize for being ableist. We're gonna get to the other stuff she said about Maddie in those interviews in a bit. It's not great. First, let's talk about how in December of 2020, almost exactly a month after this whole Twitter mess, Sia apologized in the Sydney Morning Herald. Looking back, I should have just shut up. I know that now, says LA-based Furler. It was three in the morning, and even though I have a rule that I don't do anything emotional past midnight, I effed up this time. But then at the same time said, what I do know is that people functioning at music's level can't get on Twitter and tell me I did a good job either. And that one needs some unpacking. Generally, the criticisms in her direction are centered around 
around. Sia didn't bother to listen to or pay attention to the autistic community when she made this and then claims it's for us and we should be happy about it. And she's making that worse by saying this inherently ableist statement. First of all, autistic folks with all kinds of support needs have agency and methods of communication. The internet is a very equalizing space where non-speaking people and primarily speaking people can communicate in the exact same way. So she has absolutely no idea who the autistic folks criticizing her were. And to quote the autistic cats on this, by writing off everyone criticizing her as too high functioning for their opinions to matter, she erases the concerns of all autistic people. It's convenient for her to act like non-speaking typists don't exist. And it also makes it seem like she's trying to say that primarily speaking autistics like myself don't have some level of authority over the situation, which is also just downright false because we're all autistic and we can look- frankly non-autistic people can look at this and have a problem. And they did. But anyway, the article went on to say that Sia admitted to struggling more with the criticism because she was trying to protect Maddie, which fine, but it does feel a little bit like she's using a 14 year old that she put in a very precarious position as a bit of a scapegoat for her own inability to take criticism. And I'm not into that because I don't think that's the move. Now, speaking of Maddie, her research into the film involves studying meltdown videos the parents of autistic kids put on YouTube, which is a horrendous problem in and of itself, as well as watching the film What's Eating Gilbert Grape, which is a film where young Leonardo DiCaprio plays an autistic character, Johnny Depp is involved, and it's one of the most fat phobic films I've ever seen. It was very weird. I did a review of that forever ago. We're not going to get into it now, but for a general gist, not the best source for autism research. Sia also talked about how she worked with Maddie to teach her all of the various tics of her neuroatypical friend that this character is based off of. And I'm going to assume she meant stims rather than tics. And again, her highly confident use of completely wrong terminology very much concerns me. I also wasn't quite sure where to like fit this into my video, but in one of the interviews I watched, she talked about how she directs and understands her characters using attachment theory, which she referred to as a new psychological concept from the 1960s and laughed saying that nobody in Hollywood has a secure attachment style and talked about how much she loves psychology. And that interaction set off some warning bells for me. First of all, psychology as a concept is very new and frequently changing. So a lot of psychological ideas from the 2010s are already outdated today. Some of the things in my earlier videos from like a year and a half ago are already outdated. So saying something from the 1960s, though I looked it up as from the 70s, is a new concept in the realm of psychology really shows me that this person does not understand psychology as much as she thinks that she does. And the fact that she then joked about attachment styles came across in the same tone and usage as people who just throw around diagnostic terminology to describe people without fully understanding the concepts. Like that friend who's like, my ex-boyfriend's a narcissist or like, oh my gosh, I'm just so OCD about having my room organized. And there's also other interviews where she just straight up diagnoses people with PTSD without knowing anything. I already was not trusting her ability to handle the concept of autism with nuance because I'd seen the film before watching these interviews with her, but this really just didn't help with that situation. Sia has also bragged in several interviews that they sent Maddie's portrayal off to the Child Mind Institute to see if it was good and they received a score of 100%. But in going through the CMI website, I could not for the life of me find anything that said that they offered such services or rating system. I'm not saying that she lied necessarily, but I couldn't find anything. And the reason that I looked is because as a media analyst, I know that you cannot score portrayals on accuracy or on being good or bad because there's no such thing. Identity is very complicated and there is no set right way to portray it. Like for example, with disability representation, two of the most problematic tropes that we see time and time again are the mutilated Avenger and the innocent saint. And those cover all of the evil and all of the nice. So if you tried really hard to avoid both of those bad representations, you would not have a character or representation to begin with. The issue is not that the disabled character is a little bit evil or a little bit pure. It's when they are all one or all the other without any nuance or authenticity or depth to their characterization. And their characterization is directly related to the fact that they are disabled. So when we judge or analyze representation, it can only be judged and analyzed in the realm of authenticity. And even that can be a little bit dodgy because something may feel super inauthentic to one person with lived experience and super authentic to another. For example, a lot of comments on this film talked about how like there's one scene where music finds gum on a park bench and she puts it in her mouth and a lot of autistic advocates were like that's bad. Autistic people would never do something like that. We're smarter and better than that. But some autistic people do that 
And that's just, a, that's fine. Like, some autistic people may have seen themselves in that one piece of the film and now feel alienated by their community members, all piling on saying that autistic people don't do that. And a lot of these things in the film that people criticized as being inaccurate were mannerisms or traits or things that are accurate to many autistic people. And in an advocacy landscape where a lot of the loudest activists are lower support needs and are criticizing this higher support needs character, which we so rarely see representation of, we need to be very conscious and careful about what we say because it easily tips into like the all autistic people are actually fully capable and feel too much empathy and these kinds of things and they feel this way and they have this lived experience lower support needs aspie supremacy situation that we so often see within community discourse and uh -huh. N no. So when we critique this, we are going to be talking about where the portrayal sits within the film itself and the authenticity of the portrayal, not whether it's right or wrong or good or bad, because that doesn't exist. The film, however, is both wrong and bad. But that's the film. So what's clear to me is that Maddie definitely came to this as a dancer. And I don't know how much of this was her or how much of this was Sia directing, to be honest, but whoever it was, they saw the physical mannerisms of autistic people and they choreographed them into a dance-like interpretation of what autism looks like, which is a very interesting concept. I know that I have choreographed stims into my work before, I do that a lot, um, but for autistic people, this movement comes very naturally to us. So just somebody who doesn't naturally move that way or understand why somebody may move that way and is trying to replicate it, it just comes across as mockery, which reads on screen very, very clearly as such because autistic people are very used to having people bully us for being different by mimicking our movements. A lot of us no longer do many of our natural movements because we were bullied so much for them. So to autistic folks, this portrayal made a lot of us feel really self-conscious and almost embarrassed, bringing back that anxiety of like, is this how people see me? And the shame associated with being bullied for who we are. It almost makes you watch the movie waiting for the music videos because at least it gives you a bit of a cognitive break from having to process everything else. Which is why it's so heartbreaking to me to know that Maddie didn't want to do this to begin with. The day before, well, we, sh we sh came for a rehearsal. It was the first rehearsal and Kate was a little bit late and Maddie arrived and she was living across the road from me at the time. And I could see something was wrong with her. She was pale and she was just unlike herself. And I'd known her since she was 11 and she was 14 now. And I was like, honey, what's wrong? Is there something wrong? And she just burst into tears and she just said, I don't want anyone to think that I'm making fun of them. And I was like, oh, honey, like, I won't let that happen. I was like, I promise I won't let that happen. And your character is based on a real person that I know. And I'm teaching you all of his utterances and all of his tics and as accurate a, 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 a uh, representation as that I know and also you can have final cut I said if there's anything in there that makes you feel uncomfortable then you can have final cut and that brings us into the conversation of the weirdness that is Sia and Maddie's relationship. Maddie grew up on Dance Moms, which is a reality show that, based on my general understanding of it, seems to be centered around a lot of moms screaming at their far too young children about being good dancers and winning competitions and stuff and not letting them be children. Sia loves reality TV, she talks about it a lot, and so when she watched the show she loved how Maddie danced, and so she tweeted at an 11-year-old Maddie and her mother and said she wanted her in her next music video. And this is how Maddie ended up being the star of her music video for Chandelier, a video that now has 2.6 billion views. Now, Sia and Maddie became friends after this, and eventually Sia became Maddie's godmother and refers to herself as Maddie's bonus mom, um, and they would hang out regularly. The two of them quarantined together during the pandemic. Maddie's mom has spoken about how they snuggle during their sleepovers together, which could very well be innocent and nice, but given that there is a 27-year age gap and most friendships with age gaps like that tend to be kind of creepy, definitely some red flags, particularly with how much Sia talks about how she saved Maddie and can't do any art without her. I just would never ever, she's little, she lived a life of stress. Like mm -hmm. her childhood was the most stressful childhood any child should ever have to live. When I met her when she was 11, I, I felt compelled to rescue her from that life wow. and to protect her. I wanna work with her till the day I die. I actually just keep writing projects for her so that I can keep her safe. <laughs> It just feels a little bit like Sia has a bit of a savior complex, which also reflects on how she talks about the two teenagers that she adopted in 2019 and how she talks about this film. The vibes of it are all just a little weird. It's both a savior situation and a very codependent, I can't make art without you and I would never career without you thing. And it just feels a little 
off, particularly because Sia has constantly talked about how she hates fame and being famous, only to then take a child and then put her into that spotlight instead and like to take her place. And that's weird. And there's also the fact that Sia is on some level controlling Maddie's career, not just by launching it with her music videos, which she had less control over, but also by dictating what projects she should work on. There was, she was offered a part in a film and I, I felt that the, the film wasn't good enough for her. And so I called Melissa and I was just, please don't do this. Like, this isn't good for her career. It's not good for her long-term credibility. This is not a good, like, co-star to be in a movie with. Um, like, so I just try and help guide, um, just, you know, you know, and I can be a pain in the butt. I think her manager thinks I'm a real pain in the butt, I'm sure. And this isn't the first time that Maddie has ended up in controversy for one of Sia's projects that she's been in the forefront of. In 2013, she was in Sia's Elastic Heart music video, which featured her at 12 years old and Shia LaBeouf in flesh-colored bodysuits covered in dirt and dancing inside of a giant cage. Some of the dance moves in the art house style clip made by Chandelier director Daniel Askill involve close contact and suggest ambiguous intimacy, although it is not overtly sexual, and rejection. Some viewers have interpreted that as sexual intimacy and aggression, and there's a reasonable argument that Furler and Askill could have been a lot more careful and less provocative. Maddie did not seem to think it was a problem in various interviews with her. She said that she had a good time, it was never meant to be remotely sexual or anything, but given what we now know about Shia LaBeouf and also some of uh, Maddie's comments about the experience, again, the vibes weird. And Sia did actually apologize for this. She tweeted, I anticipated some pedophilic cries for this video, and all I can say is Maddie and Shia are two of the only actors I felt could play these two warring Sia self-states. I apologize to those who feel triggered by Elastic Heart. My intention was to create some emotional content, not to upset anybody. So when it comes to Maddie's involvement in music, I don't blame her, really at all. She was 14 at the time, she vocally did not want to do it, and she was told by somebody she really trusts that it was okay and that she would be fine, and she probably knew that if she refused, Sia would not make the film because Sia didn't want to make anything without Maddie in it, so it's an impossible situation for her. And again, she's a child! Um, in an interview with The Independent more recently, Maddie was quoted as saying, I've actually stayed out of all of it just because, you know, I'm 18 years old and it's a lot of pressure. I understand why people would want someone who's actually on the spectrum with autism to play this character, but in terms of the dance sequences, I think that's why Sia chose me to bring the dream world to life. It was all made with good intentions and with a good heart. I felt so much responsibility, but I felt I was capable. I knew going into this that people were going to love or hate it. I get into my head at times. I'm going to try and replicate those mannerisms and those tics, but then I started to watch each video and I realized every single person is so special in their own way. That's how Sia and I came up with music, her mannerisms, and her own thing going on. The article then went on to say, she sounds genuine, but this is the kind of wide-eyed naivete that suggests Ziegler might not have been the best choice for the role in the first place. I've seen some creators use this interview with her as a way to say that we should also hold Maddie accountable for her actions in this film because she's a full adult now who is defending Sia, but I very much disagree with that take, if only because I, at the age of 18, said things defending my abuser and did and stop saying those things until I finally put the pieces together several months after having no contact with them. And Maddie is very much still in contact with Sia and has had Sia in her life for a very long time, so I can't really blame her for feeling the way that she does. Obviously, from a distance, I can't definitively say, like, that relationship is bad and a problem, but based on what we do know about it, there are a lot of red flags and it does feel a little bit obsessive and codependent and unhealthy. And if this were a relationship between a 39-year-old man and a 12-year-old boy, there would be a lot more conversations and questions about this. Let's get back to the movie. I just wanted to bring in that, like, little extra bit of context there. I found very few of the articles about the problems with this film. Um, have actually mentioned the blatant racism that is throughout the movie as well. In the opening dance number, Maddie has significant skin darkening makeup and box braids. Um, Eden from the Autistic Cats did an excellent breakdown of the other racial issues, so we're just gonna read that instead. The list of racial offenses includes, but is not limited to, white dancers and characters in black hairstyles such as Bantu knots. Ziegler included, she wears box braids in two dance scenes. A Chinese immigrant abusing his wife and murdering his son. Hate crimes against Asian Americans are surging right now, and this scene certainly did not help with the stigma that the community is facing. A scene in which Ebo, who may I remind you is the only character with HIV, tells Zhu that his autistic brother is dead and that the people in his village consider autism to be a curse. Zhu's drug dealer, who appears to be white, with his hair in cornrows while wearing various appropriated Asian clothes. A scene where Zhu refers to a clay figurine as her spirit animal. Zhu is not Native American and neither is Kate Hudson. And yet another bizarre dance scene in which Zhu is wearing what appears to be an Asian dress. Music has on a headdress and clothing with a collar reminiscent of Chi Pao. And music grandmother has literal chopsticks in her hair. 
Yikes. So let's go through this film in as much detail as I can without fully losing my mind. Also, for the record, I did not watch this or any of the interviews for this video in ways that would give money to Sia or those trying to platform her in a positive light. Normally I have a hard time doing that with interviews because if you download videos you don't get the captions, but most of the interviews on this film were not captioned, which says so much about how they feel about the disabled community to begin with. I also watched this movie for the first time at 1.25 speed to make it more tolerable, and then when I watched it a second time to get all this information at normal speed, it made it exponentially more painful than it initially had been because it dragged at 1.25 speed and normal speed, who so slow. Anyway, we're gonna go back to Eden from the Autistic Cats because uh, they did a wonderful job describing the first bit, so we're just gonna read that. If you wanna read their full review, which you should, it's in the description for you. The opening scene of the movie made my stomach drop. It begins with Maddie Ziegler as the non-speaking autistic character Music in a pair of white underwear dressing herself. She grunts and moans and starts hitting her legs after putting a pair of white pants on. This struck me as an unusually intimate way to begin a film of this nature, and it was uncomfortable to watch because Ziegler isn't actually autistic. Every single item of clothing Music wears throughout the whole movie is white. I assume that this costume choice is meant to symbolize innocence and purity, an ableist trope often employed in stories about developmentally disabled people. Right after watching Ziegler dress herself while mimicking autistic body language, the viewer is launched into what I can only describe as a total sensory nightmare. The first dance sequence of the movie in which music wears braids shaped like headphones and another white child actor is seen in Bantu knots is full of aggressive warm colors and rapidly flashing lights, which could easily cause seizures in viewers with photosensitive epilepsy. One minute into this movie, and I was already overstimulated. Yet somehow the sensory overload wasn't even the worst part of my experience during this first scene. What hurt the most was watching Ziegler's grotesque robotic impersonation of autistic movement and body language. When I was younger, I would roll my eyes and put my front teeth over my bottom lip as a stim. I still flap my hands, flick my fingers, rock, and do just about every other classic stim you can think of, but I don't stim as much in public anymore because of how those mannerisms have been received. One time when I was in a gymnastics class at around six or seven years old, I was rolling my eyes really hard while facing my teacher who was across the room. She called my name and said, don't roll your eyes at me. And I told her I wasn't, but she replied with, I know what I saw, and then told me to sit out of the next activity. There was nothing I could do to make her believe me, to believe that I was stimming, not being disrespectful. So to see a neurotypical actress portray an inorganic, stereotypical version of the same stims I was ashamed and misunderstood for as a child, knowing that she has never faced the same stigma or internal distress from trying to suppress natural movements gutted me. Ziegler doesn't know how to stim like I do, and the fact that she was forced to try, even though she cried during filming because of it, is unacceptable. There is almost no way to accurately direct a non-autistic person to move like an autistic person because the way we move is so deeply entangled with our neurology. And yet, as I kept watching, it became apparent to me that I would have to endure this open mouth caricature until the end credits. Thanks, Sia. So we have that as our opening scene. I'm not going to go through what each song intercuts and where specifically and what that means in the summary because the artistic meaning is rather lost on me with those, and I don't feel like they necessarily accentuate the plot too much. What I will say about the dance scenes is that artistically the cuts from dance to reality don't quite work smoothly, not to mention that the movement and level of eye contact and interaction that music does in this little dance stream world of hers is very jarring in comparison to the version of her that we see in the narrative sections, like to the point where the main message I'm getting from this is Inside of Music's mind is an abled neurotypical girl who's hiding in this autistic body and is stuck there, which I would not put past Sia for thinking up, but I need to at least acknowledge that there are issues with that narrative. I also initially thought that the music videos would only be the inside of Music's head, which showing that like she processes things differently with communication differences represented in speech versus music, but no. Everybody gets their own inner narrative situation via music video, so it isn't even metaphorically significant. It's just there and also generally super bright and has a lot of strobe lights and quick cuts and it's the most inaccessibly filmed thing I've ever seen. But moving on, after this dance scene, she goes through her morning routine of eating her eggs and having her grandmother braid her hair and then she walks down the street and goes to the library where she reads a textbook about dogs for a bit. And there's two things to note here. One, walking down a city street by herself, she experiences zero stigma or danger or anything as a very visibly disabled person. And yes, most of the people around here might know who she is and not care, so that's why. But this theme continues throughout it and it kind of smooths over a huge part of disability which makes her look even more like a narrative prop than a human being. Though that's not hard because she also has no personality or wants or needs or clearly special interests. Um, she just occasionally experiences a single emotion as a treat. But that's rare and only when convenient to the plot to move forward. Second, the AAC. Augmentative Alternative Communication method that uh, music uses is only able to express things like I am happy and I am sad. 
which given her clear ability to understand textbook level language from this scene, I do not understand why she is not using a more complicated and thorough form of AAC, i.e. typing and pictures. She uses a tablet that has the ability to download a full AAC keyboard app onto it, and she clearly has the ability to type on there, so why does she not have more ability to communicate. And there's also the added aspect that understanding and conceptualizing feelings is a lot more complicated for most autistics than understanding and conceptualizing other concepts due to interoception issues, which means that if she can understand and express her feelings using language, she can definitely express literally everything else using language. Truly, the AAC plot hole broke my brain for a good while. Anyway, so after reading about dogs, she goes home and she finds her grandmother unconscious on the floor and just straight up doesn't notice it for a bit until one of her neighbors comes in. Um, his name is George, that'll come back later, and he calls 911, and her body gets taken away. They ask George if she has any next of kin, and this is when we meet Zoo, who's played by Kate Hudson. Zoo is newly sober, mostly because she's on probation, presumably for selling drugs, which she continues to do anyway after this. We're gonna get to that. She shows up at the apartment, and she's like, OMG, hey, music, I'm your half-sister, and then promptly tries to find if there is a will with money in it, and then calls the LA County Department of Mental Health to try to get rid of her sister like she's some sort of weird puppy. And speaking of puppies, Maddie goes to bed and has a musical dream about dogs, so maybe dogs is her special interest. The next morning, she gets up and expects Zoo to follow the routine of eggs and braiding her hair per usual, but Zoo does not know how to braid hair. She has a shaved head, so I, that doesn't surprise me. Um, and Music ends up having a meltdown, and Zoo does not know how to control it. But the next door neighbor, Ebo, who's played by uh, Leslie Odom Jr., who you may know from Hamilton, shows up to help save the day. And content warning for restraint, you can skip to this time code if you need. 3706. Now he saves the day by putting her in a prone restraint, which involves laying her on the floor and then laying on top of her. And when Zoo starts crying and goes, no, you're hurting her, he says he's crushing her with his love. And this is one of two times this form of restraint is used in this film. This type of restraint is very, very dangerous and can often become deadly. And even when not deadly, causes serious trauma for people who've been restrained like this. There are many ways to de-escalate and support people during meltdowns. We discussed that on this channel before. This is not one of them. Do not do this. Um, when the restraint scenes initially hit the public, there was a second wave of outrage on Twitter. Sia tweeted on February 3rd, I plan to remove the restraint scenes from all future printings. I listened to the wrong people and that is my responsibility. My research was clearly not thorough enough, not wide enough. And then also promised that all versions of the film that still included the restraint scene would have a disclaimer before the film, which doesn't really change anything, but it's an attempt, I guess. Regardless, Every single person that I know, including myself, who has had the displeasure of watching this movie, has seen a version that both includes the restraint scenes and does not have the warning. So I don't know why she didn't follow through on that, but she did not follow through on that. Now, once music is calmed down, Ebo braids her hair and helps out around the house while Zoo gets ready and such, and then they all go on a walk together. This is where we learned that Ebo was an immigrant from Ghana whose brother was autistic, but in his village they thought that was a curse. I can't remember if it's in this interaction that we learn his wife left him for his brother or if that's the other time they go on a walk together. But yeah, that's his tragic backstory. He teaches boxing for a living. We also learn that Zoo's dream is to run away to Costa Rica, and it is about this point where you kind of realize that this whole film is gonna be a slightly messy, weird love story between Zoo and Ebo with music as their like wingman who's just kind of there. All of which is made extra awkward by the fact that Zoo and Ebo don't really have any chemistry at all. Like, just. It's, oh my gosh, it's painful. Um, but bonus points for the line here where Zoo tells Ebo she was planning on sending music to the people pound later, but maybe she'll just keep her a little longer. And I cannot get the absolute horror that is the concept of a people pound out of my head. Now, after this, they introduce the subplot of the domestic abuse situation with the kid of the Chinese immigrants who's learning to box with Ebo because his dad is forcing him to. He only ever directly interacts with the main protagonists once or twice, and I'm still really confused as to why this subplot exists or what it's trying to say. But there are a lot of clips of him just kind of staring at music from a distance throughout the film to like tie it together, I guess. Also, for the record, the captions just say speaking foreign language, which felt vague and weird, and I didn't like it because we're at a point in society where if you're making an English film that includes non-English language in it, you include English captions for it. You just do. That is etiquette. So again, mm, felt a little racist. I don't know. 
Nah, didn't sit right. Now, then there's a sort of sisterly bonding scene after this, I guess, which is then followed by Zoo going to her dealer to have a conversation that was very hard to follow. Most of the dealer conversations kind of feel purposeless, uh, but generally they're friends and he keeps giving her passes, so she's in a lot of monetary debt to him, but she promises to pay him back eventually. They also have more chemistry with each other than Ebo and Zoo do, and so they would be worse for each other, but I think they should get married. And then we see her go to a client who sends her to a new client that we're gonna meet later. We'll get back to that. After this is more exposition of of, see, they're all just one big happy family learning to love each other, wow. And then, again, there's no chemistry. At all. Based on C's interview, she cast all of these people separately via Twitter, which explains the lack of chemistry and slightly odd dynamics often playing between characters in a way we don't typically see in films with a typical audition process. So I think that would explain why. Um, now the three of them go on a walk in the park where Ebo explains autism to Zoo, a lot of which is actually explained fairly okay. But the line where he says that music is incapable of change did not sit right with me because if she was incapable of change, she would have just gone poof after her grandmother died, I guess. She's, there's been so much change. The logic of the statement makes no sense. She has another meltdown in the park. This time Zoo does the restraint. It's seen as like a major win for her in like starting to really understand and bond with her sister or whatever. I don't like it. That night music goes to bed and Zoo and Ebo flirt for a while. I think it's flirting. Again, the two of them. It's stilted. It's weird. Nah. But it's like flirting and like deep talks about stuff. Great. The next night, Ebo plays the piano while Zoo sings a song and music listens, and that sounds unimportant, but it becomes important later. And then Zoo says that she and music will be his dates to his brother's wedding with his ex-wife. And then the next day, Zoo can't get anybody to care for music, so she just brings the kid with her on a trip to meet the rich people she's selling drugs to. What is this movie? So today, they're going to their new client. And when they walk into the space, Zoo sees a wig on a mannequin and immediately goes, is that a Sia wig? Is Sia here? Which felt a little presumptuous. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's one of the words because like, I remember the first time I saw that scene and I was like, who would immediately notice the wig on the table and then just go, oh my gosh, she is here, where is she? Because that would take me a lot of time to process that far. It felt very unnatural and kind of like everybody recognizes me in the world, which like, no. Not really. So anyway, this is Sia's magical cameo as herself, which feels really jarring and random and out of the blue in regards to the rest of the plot and vibes of this movie, and it does not work. Um, but this version of Sia is trying to get pills to send to Haiti because there's been an earthquake and they don't have any of the good meds for the injured children, and she's calling it Pop Stars Without Borders. My favorite tidbit about this cameo is this. I asked Vince, my um, producer to help me and he came and he whispered into my ear at one point you're coming off a little bit unlikable is that <laughs> is that what you want and I was like yes yes <laughs> the whole thing just aged it just it just aged we're just gonna leave it at that so then she goes back to her dealer and he gives her an HIV drug and asks her to deliver it which she does only to find out that the medication is for Ebo which is played as some sort of absolutely big life-changing reveal for the viewer and maybe I'm just too deep in the disabled community to see that and just go okay cool that's fine all right and move on without much reaction I don't know, is that normal? After this, Zoo brings music on a walk and then gets distracted, so then music gets stung by a bee, but she's allergic to bees, and Zoo brings her to the hospital. Cut to a boxing match run by Ebo, where Felix, the subplot kid, is going to fight and his dad is yelling at him, and then he decides to hug his opponent rather than fight. Cool. That night, Zoo becomes not sober and goes to Ebo to flirt with him more, and he's a responsible adult and is trying to get her home, but then an adult coming into the hallway sees it and is like, Hey, maybe I was trying to take advantage of her. I don't know. And so he tries to help Zoo and then Zoo fights the guy and then the guy calls the cops and she gets mad and says, no, please don't. I'm on probation. And Ebo is like, you're what? And then Zoo just runs and goes to a club to get intoxicated part two. Cut to subplot Felix scene where he's on the computer and he hits an apply for a service dog button. It's not structured how service dog applications work at all at all, but we're going to get to that later. The audio over the scene is his parents fighting. He then goes to the kitchen to see the fight and then his dad kills him. Again, it's sad, but it it's not attached to anything. Why is it there? And then there's a song where everybody is just in dubiously Asian traditional wear, sort of, kind of. It doesn't feel like it's being culturally respectful at all. I'm sorry, I don't know enough about Asian, generally that cultures and that continent in order to give you a better explanation, and I do apologize. But given the context of how Sia handled everything else in the film, I would be very shocked if this were even remotely respectful. I really don't think that it is. Um, and also from the thing that Eden from Autistic had said, it definitely isn't. So anyway, Music wakes up to find Zoo knocked out on the couch with a very bloody face, and they go and they have their breakfast routine, 
and the music goes out on her daily adventure, and Ebo comes over, very concerned for Zoo, reasonably, and they have a little heart to heart. And then Ebo basically says, I'm leaving. And then he leaves, and she goes into crisis mode. So she goes to neighbor George, who you may remember as the one who found the grandmother at the beginning, and she asks him for help, which is a very big character development, both for her and for him. And then it's a montage of sorts of her trying to get her life back together and getting music ready to be institutionalized. Yeah, so she brings music to the facility on the same day that Ebo goes to the wedding of his brother to the ex-wife, and as Zoo is unpacking music stuff, music suddenly says, don't go, sit down now, which is effectively the first organic speech she's come up with in this film, and it's, 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 a, it's a plot device. It's so clearly a plot device, and it makes Zoo suddenly change her mind and take music out of the facility, and they run to the wedding, though I don't know how they knew where the wedding was, but sure, large romantic gesture or whatever, but it's not romantic because they have no chemistry, so they arrive. Zoo runs on stage to talk to Ebo and says she's sober now and she's gotten her life together and she is going to stay and take care of music because music taught her how to love someone and then the two of them kiss in front of everybody and everybody awkwardly claps and they're like we're gonna sing you a song now which is the one they sang earlier in the film but this time music starts singing it instead and it's supposed to be an emotional moment. And then cut to some time later, they have her eggs cooking on the stove, and the doorbell rings, and a lady says, not kidding, hi, I have a delivery for Music Gamble, and then just hands her a dog with a leash that says service dog on it. And I'm not going to go into too much depth about how service dogs work, but the majority, if not all programs, you have to work with the trainers of your dog throughout the process so they can train it to your specific needs. And that's, that can take anywhere from one to three years. So the fact that Felix applied for it for her is not how that works. The fact that it's clearly shortly after the application went in is also not how that works. And a service dog is not delivered like a package. You have to go get it to learn how to handle your dog and you have to go through human training to learn how the dog's training works. And I will also say that given Maddie's support needs, particularly in regards to needing deep pressure therapy during meltdowns, a much larger breed of dog like a gold retriever or a lab would be much better suited for her. Not to mention that most service dogs are 30 to $50,000 and are not covered by insurance. So I'm not sure where the money came from for it, but we're just getting uh, move on. They all live happily ever after. The end. So that's the film for you. Uh, what's most baffling to me about it, other than the fact that the thing was made at all, um, is how so many people signed up for this and promoted it, like large famous people. We have Kate Hudson, Leslie Odom Jr., Maddie Ziegler, George is played by the guy who played Joe in Princess Diaries, Hector Elizondo, he's famous for other stuff, but that's what I know him from. Uh, Tig Notaro is involved, Shia LaBeouf and Jonah Hill were both involved for a bit, though, okay, this is, I didn't put this in the script, but I've been thinking about this. So Shia LaBeouf was supposed to be Zoo's character and Zoo was supposed to be a guy, and then they changed it when, then it was Jonah Hill, and then... Uh, they changed it to Kate Hudson. And so I'm wondering if she was going to add an extra representation by having it still be a love story between Leslie and the main guy or what the plan was for that or how much that changed when they changed the gender of the character. I genuinely have no idea, but I'm almost glad that they didn't try to shoehorn some gay representation in there as well um, with straight people playing the gay characters because I feel like she would have done that. Anyway, all of these people were involved and it makes me question a lot of things about the people that I looked up to within the arts business and the arts business in general because they all genuinely thought this was okay and were defending Sia which scares me. The other thing is that in interviews, Sia always talks about how this film is about a girl named Music, but it is objectively not about her. She is not even in a lot of the scenes. The film is clearly about Ebo and Zoo's relationship. So from a simple marketing standpoint, they did a bad job, but that is also consistent with other films where it's about the disabled character, but in reality, it's about everybody around them, i.e. Gilbert Grape. But the only thing is, is that a lot of the things about this film that are consistent with disability media canon are consistent with films that came out before the year 2000. Maybe like one or two films from 2000 to 2005, but after watching nearly a hundred different autistic representations, this film feels like it came out in the early 1990s, which isn't even an excuse for being problematic because even Rain Man from 1988 was more ethical and authentic with its representation than this film was. Most representations I have seen that center around the autistic or disabled character being a narrative prosthesis, basically something that exists to prop up the narrative and the growth of the main people, give more depth of character than music got. Was this film as bad as I thought it was going to be? The first time around a year and a half ago, 
Yeah, it was. But the second time around last week with the context of the wider artistic canon, honestly, no. It's a bad film in general, and the representation is probably the most problematic and harmful I've ever seen, but I can see what her inspiration was, and I can see where she thought she was jumping off of, and I can see how this film could have been so much better, most notably by making music a non-disabled toddler or a dog. Because even making music played by an autistic person would not have helped this much, to be honest. Um, and she also needed to give depth to all the characters and flesh out various plots more, and she needed to make it clearer what the purpose was of the music videos to the narrative. What I'm trying to say is that this film could have been saved, it could have been at least semi-decent, but because she was surrounded by Yes Men, because she co-wrote the screenplay based on a short story she wrote 15 years ago, because she directed it and she designed the costumes and she wrote the music, there wasn't an outside eye to challenge her in order to make it better, or even remotely ethical or good. And also not racist, and also not promoting restraints that kill people. She had all of the resources to do a good job, and she chose not to use them because that would impede on her artistic process, and everyone else just went, yeah, you're a genius, it's fine, which was a failure by a lot of people on a lot of levels. And it really, it reads like a vanity project rather than a love for the art form, and a vanity project that caused severe damage on so many levels that she then refused to take full accountability for. And speaking of Sia and accountability, the reason for making this video is that in an interview in May she said, I'm on the spectrum and I, and I, I, uh, uh, I, and I'm in recovery and uh, uh, whatever, there's a lot of things. And I think in be and being in recovery and also knowing about which kind of neuroatypicality you may have or may not have, I felt like for 45 years I was like, uh, how am I, like, what is, how do, I've got to go put my human suit on. And, yes. and only in the last two years have I become my, like fully, fully myself. And when this first happened, a lot of people were talking about how they thought she was faking this or whatever in order to cover up the music situation, which I can guarantee you is not true for a handful of reasons. Other than the fact that we should not be guessing who is faking diagnoses for clout, but that, because that's a serious problem, but we're going to table that for now. First, we know that Sia has a bunch of really common comorbidities with autism, specifically complex PTSD, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and addiction, and that she has been on a constant mental health journey, with some diagnoses happening right after this movie was filmed and going to rehab after all of the film's backlash. Most diagnostic criteria are centered around coping mechanisms, meaning that somebody in panic mode is more likely to realize that they fit the diagnostic criteria for something. This is why the neurodivergent community expanded so much over the pandemic, and why most late diagnosed autistics get diagnosed during or after a significant autistic burnout period. Second, from a PR perspective, if you had a crash and burn a while ago and you're just starting to move on, don't bring it back into the spotlight again two years later with a public announcement, and you also don't make that public announcement during a casual interviewer with the most recent Survivor winner. Not to mention that her suddenly being autistic is not going to help with all the criticisms of the film, autistic people can still make problematic representation. And based on how she talked about it in this interview, it seemed like her ableist views on autism have not changed all that much, given that she still uses a lot of euphemisms. Obviously, every autistic person can refer to themselves however they want to, but given her history with ableist language and rhetoric, it's very clear in this interview that that hasn't changed a whole ton. The third thing is that most of us clocked this a while ago. Armchair diagnosis is a problem. I work on a video about that right now. Um, most folks in the community know this, so we don't say things out loud, but as people who rarely see people in the spotlight who are explicitly autistic, we tend to notice people who give off a lot of the autistic vibes and just kind of hold them in their heart as one of us. And I'm I'm trying to explain the neurodivergent version of gaydar, and it's still a problem because it inevitably promotes some level of stereotype in our own heads of what neurodivergent looks and feels like. Like, for sure, it's something I'm working really hard to unlearn because I just do it on habit. Um, but it does happen to most people in the community, completely. And Sia, as a super eccentric artist who struggles with mental illness and addiction and doesn't like social interaction and has a hyperfixation on a child and coped with criticism about her film by completely exploding in every direction, a lot of us had a feeling. And we didn't talk about it at the time because that's the right thing to do, but now that she's out, a lot of the autistic community is talking about how we guessed this a long while ago. And what's interesting about this is that the situation we saw with Sia and music happens a lot with disability representation, particularly with autistic representation, because undiagnosed autistic creators decide to make representation, realize whether they're aware of this or not, 
that it's weirdly applicable to them and then they make the characters more of a caricature to differentiate their own experience from the character so they don't have to confront the fact that they might also be autistic. We also see this in a different way with autism moms whose special interest is their autistic kid and will often other their child as a way to further separate their own experience from the openly autistic experience, usually not even noticing that they're doing it. And these are the people that typically talk about how they're the best allies, they understand the autistic experience the best, they speak for autistic people and are in fact helping us, etc, etc, and typically cause the most harm and perpetuate the most stereotype about autistic people, and also refuse to listen to us because once they do they might have to face their own reality and that's just too scary. So to me it feels less like Sia was bad at researching for the movie and more like she probably kept reading things that were close to her lived experience and went, well this can't be right, that's not what I think autism is, that's like me, so it doesn't work, and ignored them. Which ended up sucking all of the humanity and general character traits out of music as a character, because if she was fully real that would force Sia to reflect on herself when what she consistently seems to prefer to do is to just jump in, be the savior, and jump out unscathed. And again, I've seen this happen with other creators in the past in all genres of art, with disability, autism, and queer and trans identities. This is just the first time that an artist in that situation has come out later in life and given us the ability to have this conversation. So to kind of wrap all of this up, no matter what, Sia has caused harm, right? Like she had the best intentions, but that does not negate the harm that she caused and any apology she gives is not going to be enough other than pulling the movie from all platforms and donating all of the profits to a reputable autism organization, which I know that she will never do. I am truly very glad that she has discovered she's autistic and feels better about herself than she ever has because everybody deserves that, but also the things she's saying right now about autism are still quite problematic so she has a long way to go in the realm of learning, which I totally understand because I have been there, I was there. Frankly, some of my earlier channel, I'm like, ooh, buddy, you had things to learn. I don't know if she'll ever get there, given that she has come this far with other mental health issues and hasn't really stopped her ableist language in relation to those either. And she also now has no reason to trust the autistic community, given how we all feel about her, which might make her feel more alienated from the identity and will therefore probably end up in weird ableist pockets of the autistic world rather than the general population. So who knows? I genuinely have no idea. But either way, I hope that you learned something today. If you have any topics you want me to cover, I have a submission form in the description for you. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.